Good afternoon. Thank you for coming out today. I hope you can hear me. Um, today's talk is really on how to not be misled by tombstones because they are sneaky and they will be things on stones that are not as they appear. And there are also some techniques for not being misled by language, um, symbols, and all kinds of things leading up to cleaning, at which point we'll clean stones virtually to try and, ex again, extract the maximum amount of information. So if you are doing family genealogy and you find this in your family plot, I think it would be kind of heartbreaking. Because what do we know about Mrs. Marion Pistol? Well, we know her husband's name, but we don't know her first name, her maiden name, the, the, the day or the month that she was born that she died. But he gets his name on his stone twice. Now, now the, the other extreme, extreme if, if you're, you're doing, doing family research, research would be to find this stone. We, we know that Olive is the second daughter of her parents. We, we know her husband's name. We know when she professed religion, a professed faith, faith in Christ, Christ got saved, saved, joined the church. church. We know when she married. We, we know from doing the math that she died almost to the day, nine, nine months, months after, after her wedding, wedding which, which suggests a death in childbirth. She, she has a, a, an interesting epitaph as the one of a kind and, and the word sweetheart where you would expect to find a surname. surname. But, but there's that nine months from her wedding that makes you think she probably died, died in childbirth because the right, right next, next door is a tiny stone that says Vivian. So, so all of this information is right out there in plain sight. Right. Uh, uh, except, except for Vivian, Vivian but, but she, she has, has a little bud on her marker, which suggests a child because that's the bud that doesn't get to open in this world, but will bloom in the next life. So, so all of this combined gives us a really, a really, a really good, good picture of, of Olive Strong. And, and in between those two, Mrs. Marion Pistol and Olive Strong, there can be all kinds of information hiding in plain sight on a tombstone. And you sort of hope to end up with your family being in this camp and, and not, not the other. other. Um, so the question is, how do you get the most information from a stone without being misled by that stone? Well, well, the first, first thing, thing to know, know is that when you are in a family cemetery and you are looking at a tombstone, what you see in front of you is, is probably a far cry from what the stone looked like when it was new. Now, it's very hard to find pictures of tombstones still in the Carver's workshop. Uh, but, but this, this is an example. example. Ada, Ada Ann Miller died in 1876, but that marker was made in 1898. And I tracked it down, and that's what it looks like today. Now, if you were searching for eight Ann, it'd be very easy to miss to misread a three and an eight or a one and a seven because over time as things decay, deteriorate, or are improperly cleaned, it literally just dissolves the stone. It just it just disappears. Um, and you also need to remember, and this just didn't show up on my slide, but just um, I'm not getting it together. The stone was carved 22 years after this girl's death which is a big gap in which mistakes could be made. And then, and then two, the stone has been in that cemetery 120 years, 123 years. So all that time is it's time for stones to crumble away, but also for mistakes to have been made because the number one thing that gets buried under the body is the family Bible. I've talked to men who had to dig up and move cemeteries and they find Bibles. Well, if your family, like mine, wrote births, deaths, marriages in the Bible, and, and then, then you bury it in grandma's hands and go, oh, we, we forgot. forgot. What, what are the chances, chances that Adam's stone, stone was even accurately carved? That information could have been misremembered. Remembered. Another, another thing, thing there's another stone, stone still, still in the Carver studio. This, this was, was in Mountain, Mountain Home where it was carved. And, and it's a pretty substantial marker. I mean, you wouldn't think, think that that's going to decay over time. time. This, this is, is what it looks, looks like, like today. today but, but notice how far the base has sunk. That's, that's all of that, that stone, stone is now underground. And, and there were carvers who put a lot of information on the base. Epitaphs, occasionally a cause of death, death added death, artwork, sometimes, sometimes their own signatures. signatures. And if that stone has sunk that deeply, now in this case, case, it probably, probably doesn't, doesn't have any carving, carving but, but there, there can be stones, stones that are underground hiding, hiding information from us. us. This, this is, is one, one of my favorite, favorite examples. examples. This, this is, is a pretty, pretty good stone. stone. We, we know, know Catherine, Catherine Wood. Wood was, was a mother, mother. We, know we know when she was born, born. we know when she died. But, but if you stand there in front of her marker, marker right, right there at ground level, level are the tops of some letters sticking out. out. 
And, and if you dig, dig down, down carefully, carefully, you would, would find, find her last words on earth. She, she bade us farewell and said, bless the Lord, O my soul, soul, bless his holy name. That, that tells us something, something about Catherine. Catherine. In, in my, my next talk, talk, I'm going to talk about, about the words of dying people and finding that on tombstones. tombstones. But, but just, just this, this is an added thing that we know about her that was almost, almost completely buried. buried. And, and how, how many stones in cemeteries have sunk below ground level, 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 level and are hiding information from us? Another, Another thing is just simple mistakes. As, as I, I said, carvers um, were doing the best they could. Some of them were illiterate. Some, some families, families were illiterate. And, and so, so all kinds of mistakes get yeah. made. And, and when we find, find something like this, you know, you know with, with a, a dished out, out you know, area, area. That's, that's a mistake. mistake. And, and a carver couldn't fix it, except, except by carving, carving the stone away and recarving. Re I, I have seen stones where a carver, carver had to carve away, away a raised letter and then indent it to make, uh, to, to correct the spelling. spelling. Sometimes, Sometimes you see little carrots and words and the line up above. Uh, in, in fact, fact that first picture I showed you of people all taking a photo of the same stone, they were, they were taking it because there was, was a typo on that stone where the carver had put the wrong month. And then it fixed it by saying, for January, we got to and carved up above. So mistakes happen all the time. Uh, this happens all the time. I see a number of these. Apparently, a, a monument dealer didn't want to waste a good piece of brand. So, so somebody, somebody paid, paid for a stone and then didn't want it, or, or there was a mistake. mistake. So, so what, what they, they would do is they would take epoxy and granite dust, dust and, and they, they would fill in the wrong carving, carving and, and then, then they would carve over it. But, but over time, time, that filler washes, washes away. away. And, and so, so we now do not, not know if Elvin Trott or George, George Webb is buried here. And, and which set of dates would be. be. Uh, there seems to be no second death date, but there's certainly two birth dates. You find, find that in a family cemetery. I, I don't know, know how you fix, fix how you tease, tease that apart. Another, Another mistake. Um, well, little, little Joe Abels was uh, <laughs> born in November and died in February of the same year. Now, now that's, that's not how my calendar works. works. I, I don't, don't know what happened here. If they flipped them, or he, he was, was actually dying in 1917. But. but mistakes, mistakes are right out there. And when we say something is carved in stone, it sounds like it's. It's accurate, right? It, it just, just means it's carved in stone. stone. It doesn't <laughs> mean that you can, that that you can trust, trust it. it. This, this is, is one, one of my favorite, favorite examples of okay. that. Look at Johnny Beach. He was, he was two years and seven months old when he died, according to his tombstone. It's, it's a, a lovely marker, uh, although broken. The uh, tombstone carver signed it down at the bottom. And, and you say, say well, well, we, we can trust, trust this. Johnny was probably close, close to three, three years old, old but unfortunately, 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 actually, he died in 1879 within the range of the mortality schedules, schedules which is when the census, census taker asked the family who in this household died in the past 12 months. And, and what we discovered from the mortality schedule was that Johnny Beach was one year old, and, and he died in September, not October. One year versus two years and seven months is a huge difference. So, so now, now, who do you trust? And, and I'm, I'm glad this isn't my family and I'm not doing this genealogy because I don't, I don't know the answer. answer. The, the question, question is, did a family member provide the information for the census or for the tombstone? Because, because the local doctors, doctors could tell the census taker who had died, died, who among their patients. patients. And, and it's, it's quite possible that a doctor, not a family member, remembered this baby and say he's a year old and got the you know, you got know, the month wrong, wrong. But, but they, they didn't did know, know they died, died of lung fever, which would be pneumonia, perhaps. So, so again, yeah, mistakes on a, a mistake on a tombstone, or this is stone oh, accurate. Another thing, thing that, that uh, can trip people up in cemeteries is, 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 is old-fashioned old language, language, words, terms we don't no, really use anymore. anymore. So, so Otis Davidson, it says, here rests the ashes of Otis Davidson. Now, now, he's a pretty, pretty famous guy in Harrison, Arkansas, because he was hanged for the murder of a young woman. And, and it's, it's my what? belief he didn't do it, and he went to the scaffold protesting his innocence. Unfortunately, he uh, did a lot of things make himself look guilty. guilty. So, so he was lifeless taken by misrepresentations born, born of excitement. Well, well always as the grave gets buried by a lot of ghost hunters and things, and, things. and it, it's, it's been, been put, put online that he was cremated. cremated. But, but nobody, nobody was cremating in the Ozarks in this, this state. If a family wanted to cremate, it was, it was such, such a rare occurrence, it would have gone to the obituary. 
and, and the body, body would have to have been taken to St. Louis or to Memphis because there were no inventories. It, it simply means, means ashes to ashes, dust, dust to dust, dust, the mortal remains of Otis Davidson. Davidson. But, but we become literal and say, well, well his ashes, ashes are there, there therefore he's cremated. Uh, another uh, uh, antiquated uh, word is um, consort. And, and I, had I had a man argue with me one time, time that this meant uh, concubine, concubine, which, which it, it does. does. It, it simply means a companion, a partner, a spouse. Queen, the queen's husband, who is not the king, is the queen's consort. And a, and a consort can be male or female. You just, I've, I've only found, found these on women's graves. Uh, it is simply a, 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 a spouse, a companion, or a partner. Now, now another, another term is relict. And a relic is a remainder. So, so that is a widow or a widower. So if you see relic, this, this uh, stone was purchased apparently by Fanny's father. She was, was a relic of, of Dr. Stephen Webb. In other words, he predeceased her and, and she was, a, she, she remained. Uh, another, another place where stone stones can trip you up or where you find intertwined letters. These, uh, there's almost like doing a puzzle because, because you have to look, look at it and say, say, am I looking at a monogram, which were surprisingly popular at one time, interlocking letters, letters. these, these are, are monograms. monograms. Am, am I looking at a fraternal lodge emblem? The Knights, Knights of Honor used OMA, OMA twisted, twisted together, together like a pretzel. Nobody to this day knows what OMA stood for, but, but that, that is the fraternal lodge emblem, emblem not, not the man's initials. We, we have religious Alpha and Omega, IHS, or Inhoc Signo in his service to sign of Jesus, and even the Confederate States of America. These are just ones I have pulled off of two tongues. You're fine. Off of tombstones. And, and when we find them, we have to make that decision. What, what am I looking at here? here? Uh, just one briefly mentioned the signatures of tombstone carvers. If you find someone else's name on a family stone, you are looking at the man who carved it. There's only one woman that I know of who carved and she didn't sign her name. Um, tombstone carvers stopped signing their stones right at 1900, and I don't know why. I have been told different things, but you rarely find a stone with a death date after 1900, and there'll be a signature from the carver, unless that stone was purchased pre-need. Uh, on a stone with stacked bases, you're most likely to find the signature on the side of a base. And in the case of a tablet, you're most likely to find it right down where the stone meets the, the base that it's in, in very tiny letters. A lot of the Arkansas carvers signed lower right corner, but Roseboro Sons of St. Louis signed lower left. And if you see Rose, Roseboro Sons, St. Louis, it's going to be this company, which was founded in the 1840s, technically still in business, and they shipped thousands of tombstones into the Ozarks. They were probably the one place people could buy a stone, a tombstone, before there were local carvers, because there really was very little access to professionally carved stones. So finding a carver's signature, to me, is always like a little bit of added information. And always very, I just, I find them fun to find. This is a, a Woodsman of the World tree trunk marker in Arkansas, but it came from Dennis in Texas, and it was signed there on the end of a log. So finding the signature is almost like a hidden puzzle because some carvers really did hide those signatures in the edge of a, of a, of a curved line um, where the family name is across a base. They'll tuck it in a, along the side of the family name. It depends on the carver, but you can find signatures, different parts of the stone, including the very back of the stone. Uh, at this point, I just pause and give a little advice. And I really can't explain this picture. It just humors me. <laughs> but advice, wear sunscreen. Uh, another piece of advice, uh, watch where you walk because cemeteries are filled with little holes from gophers and creatures and footstones that will stick up and trip you and things that can, uh, well, lots of things that can trip you. Uh, be very careful. I've, I've only once seen a snake in a cemetery, so I, I really don't worry about that. But you really can fall very easily. Um, Third piece of advice, carry dog biscuits. I once had to make friends with a very big pit bull 
in a very isolated cemetery. And thanks to having a bag of dog biscuits, we made friends. And then he followed me around the cemetery for the rest of the day, usually lifting his leg just before I took a picture, but he was a delight. And I felt better having him with me. And, but seeing him running full tilt at me and I'm out in the cemetery by myself, I, I was worried. But carrying dog biscuits, you can't go wrong. And if you find a hungry dog, a starving dog, a puppy, it's always good to make friends. Um, but my main piece of advice is check the back of tombstones. And I know it sounds self-explanatory, but I am so guilty of forgetting to do this. Check the backs of the stones. Um, you never know what's gonna lurk back there. I have seen on children's markers, carvings that look like weaving, that look like lace, that look like quilts. I have seen a, a, a man's cause of death killed by a falling tree on the back. I have seen verses of poems there was one stone um, that has on the front of the stone two verses on how to lay out a body and four verses on the back of the stone on how to bury that body. And uh, very poetic language, but it's all on the uh, processing of a body. And most of it's hiding behind the back of the stone. So this is, in, this is near Mountain Home. And it's a row of stones all made by the same per person. And here's an example of what the fronts look like. Whoever carved these got his ends backwards. And if you notice the word born, he left the R out. So he had to put up you know, a little higher. And, there, and these little stars across the top, it's, it, they're really lovely carvings. But the backs of those stones, the first one, knew the Bible by heart, love and mother gone, but not forgotten. And it's lovely pointing finger. And then the third one, May 1919, this work was put up by his grandson, J.C. Hawkins. And from that we know, May 1919 was about 30 years after those people died. So 30 years later, the grandson makes markers for his family. So check the backs of the stones, even when you are in the new part of a cemetery. I have seen aerial photos of the family farm I have seen uh, poems written by the grandchildren. I have seen man, uh, tattoos uh, all on the backs of stones. And sometimes I found <laughs> <laughs> jokes. In fact, I, one of my favorites, I didn't put it in this talk, was a man in the front of his stone said he lived well and laughed much. In the back of his stone, it says in quotations, I've made many deals in this life, but I sure went in the hole on this one. <laughs> So always check the back of the stone. Oh, I've also seen genealogical charts uh, with all the children, grandchildren, grandparents, grand grandparents in, in detail. So check the backs of the stones. Check the backs of the stones even when you have to work really hard to get in with them. This is a isolated cemetery that the um, Cubs, uh, the Eagle Scouts clean up periodically and then it grows back up. This iron fence is very hard to get into and you have to climb over a giant yucca to get in. But you see that tall marker with the urn finial on top. If you walk around behind it, there is Juno Carter's photograph. He died in 1886, and you can still see the faint outlines of him. But and it's exposed to the elements. There was probably a cover at one time, but there he is. And but you have to you have to remember to walk around the back, um, which brings me to one of my favorite subjects. Uh, photography on tombstones. Photos on stones are usually going to be very obvious. Um, photography was invented in 1826 in France. The, de the, the daguerreotype was invented after that. The ability to make copies of photos, that was very important because it was just one time, one sitter, one photo. But once you could make copies, uh, along comes a, a new process in 1854, two Frenchmen patent the technology to take an existing photo, transfer it onto a little disc of fabric, glaze and fire it, and then embed that ceramic disc into a tombstone. And this became wildly popular, especially in immigrant communities. For some reason, Italian uh, Catholic cemeteries are a lot of early examples. Although they didn't get, the technology didn't really get patented in this country until the 1890s, but they existed here, so you get things like this, and they're obvious, they're lovely. The problem is that the technology wasn't very good, and in some cases, the picture starts to fade. It just starts to disappear. 
And the people who made these photoceramic must have realized early on that the pictures weren't that stable. So they tried to help out a little. Maybe the original photo was faded. So they would take ink, and you'll find this a lot. They would put in the pupils. And in this case, they also gave them a bit of a toupee with ink. <laughs> and unfortunately, what happens is the picture will eventually fade, and all that will be left was the hair and the eyeballs. <laughs> And you see this a lot. And I don't know why some pictures held up and some did not. So if you find something like that in the cemetery, you see what you're looking at. I have, uh, there's, a, there's a, a whole book on the subject of photo ceramics. And they give some really interesting examples of the picture fading away, but the ink remaining. Uh, unfortunately, because they're ceramic, they damage extremely easily. They can be vandalized. They can be shot at. They can be gouged. I, I kind of wonder if this woman here, if somebody really hated her because it looked like they had an ice pick. To her, to her ceramic. Um, so because they're so fragile, somebody got thinking, well, what can we do to make the pictures permanent? And this is why I'm including this in today's talk, because they made these, they protected pictures by covering them up and hiding them. Warsaw, Missouri had a, a business at one time called Warsaw Zinc Works, the WZW. And all these zinc markers that were cast in foundries you see in, in bigger cemeteries were in vogue up until World War I. And then the war came along and the foundries had to retool for the war effort. And when the war was over, zinc was finished. Nobody wanted it any longer. Warsaw Zinc Works did something a little differently. They used sheet metal and they bent it into shapes. And then they would add, um, oops, well, I'll just say that way. They would add details, including these little doors. And behind the little doors, you could put an obituary or a photograph. And the glass over the obituary had a gasket, a rubber gasket, and it sealed it tight. So as long as the gasket didn't fail and the little door stayed down, the, the paper stayed intact. So here's James Donald, who died in 1899, and you can read his obituary and you can see his picture. Warsaw Zinc Works patented various types of these markers and put little plates with patent numbers on the backs. I have found them, uh, well, obviously in Missouri, a few in Arkansas. Generally, the metal starts to fail and then the glass goes. But when you find intact ones, uh, remember to look for the door. And if you can see, there's a little tiny knob and it's very, it's very small. And that's where you lift up and you can see what's behind it. Um, they were apparently very popular out west. Warsaw Zinc Works shipped a lot of zinc markers, I think Colorado, New Mexico. And there are books on zinc that have more information. This is the Warsaw Town Cemetery, and it has four or five of these zinc markers. Some have lost their doors, some are still intact. This was the best example to show you. But the town cemetery has got uh, quite a bit of these kind of blue-gray metal markers. Um, tombstone symbolism. I want to just go very, very quickly through some symbols, because again, this is a place where people can get um, misled and go down blind alleys in, in research. Tombstone symbolism was used by our great grandparents and farther back as almost a, a language. People could, everyone knew what the symbols meant and they could combine them to create sermons on stones. A symbol is nothing more than a little picture that takes the place of a very complex thought. An app on a phone, a, a Starbucks logo. You know, they don't have to put words. You know when you see that picture, that there's going to be coffee or a golden M will be McDonald's or the app on your phone. Tombstone symbolism was the same way. The symbol itself doesn't always make, doesn't always tell you the meaning at one time people simply knew that. So I'm going to do just a very quick alphabet of the most misleading symbols. Starting with A is for anchor and anchors represent hope. I have heard people say, we don't know when grandma had time to join the Navy because she's on the census at, on the family farm. When did she manage it? Well, great grandma wasn't in the Navy. The, the anchor represents hope. You can see it down at her feet. And there's a very good reason for this. You've heard of the uh, seven deadly sins. Well, balancing the seven deadly sins are the seven cardinal virtues, prudence, temperance, so forth. Of the seven cardinal virtues, the three most important are faith, hope, and charity. And they're always shown as women, and they're always shown holding something that tells you who they are. So faith has her hands out to help the poor. Um, I'm sorry, 
Charity has her hands out to help the poor. Faith holds a cross. Hope always has an anchor. And that makes sense because the anchor represents our hope, our faith, our belief in heaven, that we will see our loved ones again, that they are in heaven, that they are anchored safe where storms are over. If you think of your voyage through life as being on a, going across an ocean, you don't drop anchor when you're in the middle of the ocean, you drop anchor when you've reached harbor. And so for all these reasons, anchors are appropriate symbols for small children, old, young, it doesn't matter. And sometimes they're very obvious. Sometimes they're used in combinations with other symbols, such as the dove. Sometimes they're floating over the gates ajar. It's a little odd because, you know, you don't think, think of anchors as doing that, but anchors can be hidden in the corners of other symbols. People love them. Now, yes, they do get used for the Navy because here's Martha Ware and there's Edward Kelly in cemeteries about three streets apart. And clearly she is, has an anchor and he has the United States Navy. He also has a rope wrapped around the shank of his anchor because that represents often it represents a chief petty officer to show how difficult his job is. So anchors, if, you find, if, if they're in the Navy, it will, it will say so. Um, B, B is broken columns and obelisk. It does not mean the stone was vandalized. It does not mean that somebody hated your relative so much that they smashed the stone. Yes, stones get broken. Trees fall on them, ice damage, weather, and so forth. But the broken column simply means it's the life cut short by death. And you can be three years old or 103 years old. When you die, death has cut short your life. And that column is broken to represent that break. So as you can see, the one on the right was meant, was carved that way. Now, there are obelisks that have been broken, but you can generally you know, tell from the top that it was made that way. Uh, here's another, here are other examples clearly carved to be broken columns or broken obelisks. Weirdly, in Eureka Springs, there's a broken column for a man who was hanged by Judge Parker's marshals. And the town story will not die that he, his marker was smashed because he was such a terrible person. He was a terrible person. But three yards away is a 16-year-old boy's grave, and he has a broken column, too. It was just a symbol. And just to make that point one more time, this is a little cartoon from 1894 showing a monument dealer's showroom. And look what he's got on display. Um, moving through our alphabet again. L is for lamb. I'm only throwing this in because they're not just for children. I like to joke that lambs were my gateway drug and that's what got me started in cemetery research. And I, at one time, had a very big database of over a thousand lambs a quarter to a third of which were for adults. Teenagers on up. A lamb is a Christian symbol. Jesus is a shepherd, we are his flock, or Jesus is the lamb of God. It's the yes, purity, innocence. There's all kinds of things that they'll, books will tell you, but really anyone can have a lamb on a tombstone. It, it's, if you're looking for a child's grave and you find where the lamb on it, then you know, you're, it, it's, it's more likely to be a child. And let me just, uh, interject right here. If you're interested in tombstone symbolism and you want a really good guidebook, I recommend Douglas Keister's Stories in Stone, still in print, uh, photographs that he took with research behind the symbols. If you find a symbol and it's not in Keister, you're probably looking at a one of a kind or a fraternal lodge that has disappeared and nobody knows much about it. There's also about 20 pages of abbreviations so if Great Grandpa's stone has L-O-O-M on it, you can look it up and it's Loyal Order of the Moose. And it will help you identify lodges through their initials. So Douglas Keister, Stories in Stone, excellent uh, symmetry guidebook. Well, going back to our alphabet M is for multiples. When you find more than one of something, you start with the possibility that you're looking at multiple deaths. So large dove, small dove, big crown, little crown, sheep, lamb, you're looking at a mother and child dying in childbirth. And when you find multiples of other symbols, you are looking at multiple deaths, uh, especially with children. So the twin daughters and the three little infants, those are both in the same cemetery. Four rosebuds and four little uh, fairies, I guess, little, little angels all for, for death, for families that lost a lot of children very close together. Those weren't quadruplets, but those were four children who died within a few years of each other. 
and the same with the Ringo children, including like an, an unnamed baby. So multiple symbols, multiple deaths. Uh, T is for trees. This is a whole other subject. A uh, lot of times, I, I'm working on a book on uh, cemeteries in Arkansas and unusual burials with interesting stories. And when I go into a town for the first time, I'll stop at the library or the genealogical society or the museum and I'll say, here's what I'm looking for. Can you tell me if there's anything really unusual in this town that you know of? And invariably, some will say, well, there's a giant stone tree trunk in the town cemetery or a lot of stone tree trunks. And that's interesting, but for the most part, they're from a fraternal lodge called Woodman of the World, and they provided a stone tree trunk as a death benefit. But not all tree trunks are woodsmen. Some trees are simply representing the life cut short, just like the obelisk or the um, uh, obelisk, uh, the, the columns. That tree, and this is in Cincinnati, has a pile of branches at its base, and every branch has a different family member's name on it. So it's representing that the tree is the, the limbs have fallen and those represent the deaths in the family. So it's not a woodsman of the world. It is simply using a tree to represent death in the family um, and the, the, the life being cut short. Now, trees, stumps are also used for children, lambs and stumps, and sometimes doves. And again, not woodsman of the world unless you find their special emblem. But speaking of woodsmen of the world, when you find a woodsman marker, you will know it because it will tell you, for example, this one here has W of the world, I think it says on that branch. And there's an ax, there's a, a splitting maul, there's a, a, there's a whole bunch of tools kind of hidden along with doves, ivy, lilies, and so forth. And the story with the, the woodsmen of the world, they were invented by a man named Joseph Cullen Root. And he was a joiner. He was a Knights of Pythias. He was a Mason. He was a member of lots of different lodges. But he wanted to invent a society that would provide a tombstone because those were hard to come by, they're expensive, so many unmarked graves. So part of the woodsman's creed is that no woman should grave. And in the beginning, local carvers could pretty much interpret that however they wanted. Uh, over time, they, they introduced a lot more different designs with the, with the stumps and the half logs and the piles of logs and so forth. But generally, you have to find the emblem somewhere on those trees to make it a woodsman stone. And they kept changing their emblem over time. The thing about the woodsman was that it was really an insurance society that had some, um, this is a quote, some fraternal lodge features. Up until the 1920s, tombstones were provided as a death benefit. And Woodsman was open to all faiths and atheists, uh, but originally it, could only, it was men only. They had to be physically fit between the ages of 18 and 45 from the 12 healthiest states in the Midwest. You couldn't live in a city. You couldn't have a dangerous profession. So saloon keepers, railroad brakemen, miners, sailors, and employees of gunpowder factories were all forbidden to join because they didn't want to pay out if they didn't have to. Um, well, this brings me to wanting to talk about another, another type of lodge. If you're in a cemetery and you find something you cannot explain, the first thing to think of is, well, am I looking at the emblem of a fraternal lodge? Maybe not one of the common ones, maybe one that didn't last very long and died out. For example, I do not know who the ancient order of pyramids were. It's, uh, there's very little about them online. The HHH, I think, is a Grange harvest. Uh, husbandry, uh, harvest, uh, health. I don't, I don't even know what that is. I can't find them. And the one up at the top is the mystic order of veiled prophets of the enchanted realm, all from tombstones. Um, the thing about fraternal lodges is that these were wildly popular, starting with, between the Civil War and the Depression. Pretty much at one point it was estimated that over half of all Americans belonged to at least one lodge. And this was at a time when there were no safety nets. There wasn't social security. People died at home. People didn't have access to insurance or tombstones. So your lodge would give you benefits. If you joined one lodge, it might provide for your widow and orphans if something happened to you. One would give you a tombstone. One would send you to a sanitarium if you got tuberculosis. 
lodges had secret signs. So if you're traveling and you get sick, you could give the secret sign for a member in distress. And anyone who saw it as a member of that lodge would have to help you. And so it was to give you peace of mind. So we all know the, the certain lodges. You're going to find these on tombstones, Masons and, um, and the Eastern Star. Odd Fellows and the Rebecca. Although I've had people say that the Rebecca's, I, they were really worried because it's a, a crescent moon and a dove and was it sinister? No, it's the Women's Lodge of the, of the, of the Odd Fellows. The Woodsman of the World, the Modern Woodsman of America and the Knights of Pythias. All lodges that were huge, widespread, put lots of emblems on tombstones. To a lesser extent, you get the Benevolent Protective Order of Elk the Ancient Order of United Workmen, the Knights of the Maccabees, and the Moose, a loyal order of the Moose, as things you can find on stones. And those are the more common ones. But at one time, there may have been as many as 2,000 different lodges in this country. They, as I said, were wildly popular. So there, it's possible that there are symbols out there on tombstones that the lodges have, have died out and nobody even knows what their, what their symbols mean anymore. So. Uh, fraternal lodges, mutual aid societies, benefit societies. I only want to talk about two, kind of as a, these are ones that could trip you up. Again, doing family research, these are things that might cause problems. Over and over again on Find a Grave, there, this emblem will show up on a tombstone and the person posting will say, oh, they're Masons, because that compass and square is what the Masons used. In fact, the J-O-U-A-M is hiding behind that symbol. They want people to think they're Masons. They, they're not. And they were, forget the word junior, that, that kind of crept in later. They were adult men. And this is one of three nativist lodges in this country. Nativist lodges, quote, were protecting the interests of native born or established inhabitants against those of immigrants. So they had hostility towards Jews, Catholics, and Blacks. They were racist, xenophobic. And when you find this on a family stone, you know a little bit more about your ancestors. Um, the Women's Lodge of the J-O-U-A-M was the Daughters of America, and you can find that on tombstones. You tend to find this in an area where there are coal mines because there was immigrant labor coming in. And their goal was to protect native-born and American industry. Uh, another one, and this one, uh, I have gotten, <laughs> I have made people so angry at me over this one. I gave a talk a while back about the, about the red men. They were also nativist and they were whites only. So despite being based on the 19th century perception of native American culture, uh, white men only up until 1974, they survived the depression. You had to be over 21, you had to be employed, you had to be of good moral character, but native Americans were excluded. So I had somebody say, this is proof that my great grandfather was Native American and I am too. And my grandmother was a member of the degree of Pocahontas, the Women's Lodge. It means the exact opposite. Unless great grandpa was Native American passing for white, joining a lodge, putting on buckskins and feather uh, headdresses and trying to, I don't know, I, I can't explain it. I don't think that happened. Now they did reorganize and they became the improved order of red men still using tote, which is totem of the eagle, which was their emblem uh, with the eagle. And you find that on tombstones a lot more often than you actually see the, the, the Native American with the tote on his headband. But you do, you still, you do find both in cemeteries. So, um, and just if there's any doubt, this was taken in Eureka Springs in the Oddfellows Lodge. Again, they, they also processed on horses wearing their, their outfits. So this, this was actually a very popular lodge and I have seen um, their emblems all across the Ozarks. And, and of course these secret societies would announce in the paper where they met, what time, and who their members were. So they weren't exactly, they weren't exactly secret. Um, moving on, African-Americans also had lodges. They had to form their own because they were excluded from the white ones. There are black masons, Knights of Pythias and Oddfellows, but they got their charters and formed lodges because they were as excluded. You find any of these emblems, these are the most popular ones. These are all African-American lodges. The Mosaic Templars was founded in Little Rock. The emblem on the tombstone is the snake biting his own tail. It's a lot harder to see on the tombstone than in this, this version. Supreme Royal Circle of Friends had a children's division because there are tombstones for children. Uh, the parents paid for insurance. 
and the International Order of Twelve Knights and Daughters of Tabor. Uh, men had seven over three, women had three over seven. So if you can't read the name, but you can see the order of the numbers, you'll know if it's a man's or a woman's. All of these lodges provided tombstones for their members, along with insurance, set up hospitals, nursing schools, uh, various, various benefits to being a member. And again, all of it ends in the depression because no one has money for dues. So how to read a tombstone, how to read a tombstone. Corliss Randall Rockwell, by the way, is uh, telling us all kinds of things in this, if, in this picture. He has 11 little steps that he's leading on, leaning on. He was two weeks away from his 12th birthday when he died of diphtheria. So the steps represent his passage through life. There's a fern, there's a book. Um, but what I really want to talk about is how do you read a tombstone using light? And then we'll talk cleaning. Available light is, is light is your friend. You can't clean every tombstone and you, there are a lot of stones you shouldn't clean. But if you can use sunlight, you will um, be able to read most stones. Now you could start by lightly brushing lichen off of the stone. That, that's, that, that helps. But here's the thing. Most of the older stones in the Ozarks face west. The writing faces west. The bodies face east because they're gonna rise at the resurrection. But the writing on the stone faces away from them because you don't wanna walk on a grave, that's taboo. And there's a lot of information on a tombstone. So if you get to a cemetery and you're there before noon, the light is gonna be on the wrong side. That stone will be in shadow because the sun is rising from the east. Now, if you wait until noon, high noon, it's directly overhead. The stone is lighting up. I'm not doing anything to that. I don't have anything. I'm not putting light on it. And that's coming down directly above. But if you wait for the sweet spot of between noon and three o'clock, the stone will be in perfect light because now the light is on the west side of the stone at an angle and it's lighting up the inscription and you get your best pictures. Now, of course, you can't be everywhere. You can't be uh, in every graveyard in that sweet spot, especially if you drive a long way. So a couple of things that can help. I use a photo reflector. You can buy them in photo stores. This one, about $100 a couple of years ago. It's got a gold side. It's got a silver side. And you can stand and you can manipulate this. And when the light is on the wrong side of the stone, you can actually move light around to the front of the stone at an angle. If you can get it across the stone, you can read. And it's hard to do in a strong wind when you're by yourself. Um, the picture I started out with, the man with the mirror, um, that's, if you have a mirror, that's great, but you because it's very hard to get a, a mirror in the exact right place. Um, such as John is doing. This is a gravestone studies conference. And John spends every gravestones tour with the mirror and people calling him over and saying, I want a picture of this. But often the person with the mirror is standing far enough back that they can't even tell if they've got the stone lit properly. People have to guide them. So it, that's complicated. The photo reflector works a lot better. Or you can get one of these. Uh, this came from Walmart, it cost $10. I love this thing. First of all, it's a very bright light and you could shine it along the side, the front of a stone. Any flashlight will work, but you can shine it and light up carving. Two, it has a bar on it, so you can do whole sections of words if, you, if you're trying to get an inscription read. And then three, it's got this, and if you ever hit a deer in the middle of the night on a <laughs> moonless night when um, your car then goes dead and you don't have flashers, this could really save you ask me how I know. <laughs> Three weeks ago, I totaled my car and cars were coming over a hill in the dark and I was dead in the, in the middle. Please, some good Samaritans pushed my car off to the side, but that red flasher then went on the back of my car and I, it's 10 bucks, so worth it. Anyway, this will help you, but any flashlight will. A black light will help you on an overcast day because it shines a purple light and you can use that to light up individual letters. Um, so... Oh, one more example using the reflector. A friend and I went out to a cemetery and unfortunately uh, we got there very late in the day and it was under a tree and this was as good as I could get without any other light source. And it's pretty good. I mean, that's a nice carving. But my friend took that reflector and walked way out, a long way away, and then shown where there was a patch of sunlight and directed an angle and that's what happened. I, I couldn't do that by myself. And when she did that, she's also a physicist. And she's really good at directing particles. 
<laughs> um, that's what happened. And I just wanted to show you this because if you've driven a long way to a family cemetery, you don't want to waste time. If, if, if a sun goes behind a cloud or you, you lose, you know, you, whatever happens, you want to be able to get the best pictures you possibly can. So that stone was not cleaned. I think I brushed maybe a little bit of lichen off of it. Another example, this is a, called a praying Samuel. It's a little statue of a kneeling child. They were very popular in the 1800s. It's under a canopy. So this, no light really reaches it. This is uh, the statue in the morning. This is the statue, right? The only time light actually touched the statue and that's pretty good, but there's the statue with the, the, the silver side of the reflector from the side. So again, if you're looking for specific information, the more you can manipulate something, uh, the better. The more, the more tricks you have, the better. Okay, cleaning stones. Uh, I'm a member of the Association for Gravestone Studies. They espouse, they believe in only one product and that is D2, a biological agent. It is safe. Um, it, is, it will not hurt plant life. It works very, very slowly. You will not get a gleaming stone when you spray this on. You need to keep coming back. Uh, maybe give it more than one application. Yes, use glove. Yes, use care. Don't swallow it. But it's not, it's not harmful. And everything else on the market has got terrible uh, safety warnings. D2 is expensive and it is heavy. So if you buy it, shipping will cost almost as much as it does. However, you can dilute it up to 50%. Um, and the technique, you have a handout that tells you how to clean, but basically wet your stone down with water. I use one of those pump up plant sprayers from the garden department in Walmart. Get the stone wet, take a plastic scraper, never use metal, scrape up any heavy encrustations of lichen from the sides and back of the stone. Spray it down with D2, either full strength or, or diluted. Lightly scrub with a plastic brush, preferably with white bristles, not, not colored bristles in case of any contamination. Walk away, go photograph something else, clean something else, eat lunch, come back, rinse it down, give another, another spray. Just to show you what this does. 2018, I went uh, to uh, Prescott, Arkansas to take a picture of this marker. Uh, Libby, Lucille and William Graham Hayes were in love. Her father disinherited her for marrying him and she married him anyway. And when she died, he was a photographer. He turned one of his photographs into this marker. He had that carved. I cleaned it and came back one year later. And this is what it looked like. It's pretty good. I was happy, except that there were still patches of the black uh, mildew lichen mold, whatever, which is very hard to dislodge. And so I gave it another cleaning in 2019. And I came back this year and that's not very good light. It was an overcast day, but that's what it looks like now. D2 is very slowly killing out the plant growth at the roots, uh, whatever the, the lichen is embedded in the stone, and it will very slowly and very carefully clean it and it will not hurt the stone or the environment. Uh, if you use D2, do not worry if your stone turns a funny color. The first time one turned salmon pink, I called Bob Young, the man on your clean, who wrote the directions. Bob, I think I've done something to a stone. And he said, it's just the lichen and the stone composition do not worry about it. It will return to its normal color. Luckily, I had the family's permission to clean a the bird's marker, but I still felt bad about it. I've had them turn emerald green or dirty brown. When they've got the, the, the D2, it's a good time to take pictures because all that sudsy stuff gets in the lettering and you might be able to read something that you wouldn't, uh, wouldn't have seen otherwise, such as a carver signature. And that brings me to the end. We have time for some questions. I'm leaving you with my email address because if you are in a cemetery and you find a stone and you want to know, you want help on reading the symbol, reading the epitaph, figuring out a carver's name, send me a picture. I live for this, truly. Um, I, don't, I, I love helping people figure out what is on a stone. I have a huge database of epitaphs. So if you can even read a few of the words, I might be able to help you with the entire verse. And again, if it's a symbol, uh, fraternal lodge, or uh, initials, I'd be happy to help you try and interpret that. So that's how to get a hold of me. And we have time to take questions. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. 
that Alabama is huge, and I don't know that there's any one. I, there's no there's no sign up that I know. I always take a picture of the sign. It says send you know contributions to. And I don't have one for Alabama, so uh, I hope Brashears, if that's who you contact, was okay. I passed the buck on that one. <laughs> okay, good. Oh, okay. Okay. They're still working on the Alabama book. They're trying, you know, the, the historical society is trying, trying, and they're getting, they're much, much closer to coming out with a comprehensive listing of everyone buried there and history and family photos. So maybe next year that will be out. So other questions? Oh, sorry, I saw, I saw that one first. <laughs> yes. If you don't dilute it, it will work faster. And uh, diluting it's really just to save money and it will take a lot longer. So if you bought a little um, bottle and you want to go farther, you can dilute it up to 50%. I use mine full strength. We have a question right here next. An edging, a curb. I think those way families kind of define their space, like this is our, our family plot, but I don't know because some people do it and some don't. In the Ozarks, I don't think we did it that often. Oh, yes. Like, like someone took an oval bathtub and saw the top off and put it on the grave. Um, they're called cradles. And I think they were meant as planters. They were just to contain plantings. Uh, Mount Holly in Little Rock is filled with them. And in uh, Memphis, um, the, big, the old city, the old cemetery, they are filled with them. And a local garden club keeps them planted every year. It all, no two alike. They're amazing. But they were a fan. And they were, yeah, that's all like, a, like a, either a rectangle or an oval on top of a grave. And they just sit there. Um, we, uh, sorry, were, there's a, were you signaling me? I have one um, from Zoom. It says, I was in a rural cemetery and found many tombstones with the same year of death on them. Any tips on researching if some sort of disease swept through the area that year or how to find an explanation? Nineteen nineteen. Um, other than local newspapers, and for some places, there are no papers. I mean, like Newton County, there's like no newspapers in, in Arkansas. I don't know how you would, I would get start with the Historical Society because if you can find the county genealogist, uh, especially if it's somebody with an encyclopedic memory like we have where I live, they'll be able to tell you. I don't know, um, you might try the archive, like, like a state archive, and see if they have anything uh, like a medical archive where they could tell you. Right, you were next. Okay. Uh, I don't think so. You know, in, in the, I don't, I don't remember that in the Music Man. It may have just been, the towns used to do pageants like with their history and they would want to start with, as though they, you know, I really don't, I, boy, I don't have an answer. <laughs> unless, well, of course, the red man had that logo, the, the tote, but unless you had the, the logo, probably not. It was probably just the, yes. Good books to recommend on this subject. They weren't, they weren't specific. Geographic location. Um, Association for Gravestone Studies has an office they used to have an, a, a library, which I think they donated, but that might be a place to ask, uh, to contact Gravestone Studies. And they have a Facebook page, and I think I would start there because Facebook, uh, AGS members love to give help and information. So if you could post a query on their Facebook page, lots of people would probably chime in with their favorite books on cemeteries. Oh, thank you so much. I just realized I was supposed to be repeating the question for the benefit of the, the Zoom program. Can you walk on private property to look at graves? Uh, in Arkansas, there is a law that says you cannot forbid somebody from being in a cemetery. I have seen signs that say no trespassing except for cemetery visitors. I don't know the law in Missouri. And I also really would be careful because I know people who've been shot at. Uh, if it's somebody's land and they don't want you on it, 
good luck. I, you probably need to know what if it's what Missouri law is. Um, I wouldn't. I I would be careful if if it appears to be private property. If it's fenced, I would be cautious. That said, I have climbed fences. <laughs> I have crawled around graveyards where I probably shouldn't have been. It just depends. If you think you have family in that graveyard, you have a stronger case.